Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with my friend and Umbrex member, Sven Biker, who runs Silicon Valley Mobility. Sven, welcome to the show. Hey, Will. Thanks for having me. So, Good to be here. I am interested to hear all about mobility, and I think that you were sharing with me before we started this acronym ACES. Why don't we start there? What does ACES stand for? And tell me a little bit about the range of your of your practice. Sounds good. Absolutely. So it's ACES. Some call it CASE, but it's like tomato, tomato. So ACES, it's A-C-E-S. It stands for Autonomous, Connected, Electric, and Shared Mobility. So basically autonomous, it's like vehicles are increasingly driving themselves and don't need uh, human oversight anymore at some point. That's A. C is connected. That is like vehicles are connected to one another, maybe to a central infrastructure. Something like you see in air traffic control that, that aircraft are communicating with one another to avoid collisions, something like this. Get this into automobiles. Electric vehicles, that's, that's obvious. Everybody knows about it. But it's quite a spectrum, actually, from hybrid vehicles through battery electrics all the way to hydrogen fuel cell. And then sharing, I mean, how much time do you have? It's ride, sh- uh, ride hailing, um, ride sharing, uh, car sharing, micro mobility, micro transit, e scooters, e bicycles, what have you. And so, what I do in this space of ACES is really to figure out deployment scenarios, uh, revenue sizing, and um, some technical due diligence every once in a while that I do. So basically figuring out what's real about this whole thing. And you've really done a fantastic job of defining your niche. So a lot of consult, you know, some consultants will be kind of generalists. I work across this industry and, you know, pharma and financial services. I do a bit of consumer, Mm -hmm. but you're like super focused and that's allowed you to you know, build a reputation and, and get known mm-hmm. in that whole sector. I'm I'm curious to hear about what's going on in this, and I also want to hear about some of your work. Yeah. But so, just sure. tell me a little about. Here, bottom line question is: I'm super excited to someday get an autonomous vehicle and be able to yeah. hop in and say, "Take me," you know, to Central Pennsylvania where we have our farm, and then just be able mm-hmm. to take a nap or read a book or, or be, or you know, not have to drive. So. Right. Um, and I live on the East Coast and I hear about this stuff, you know, Arizona, California, they mm-hmm. always hear like trials are underway or there's now cars on the road. But when am I going to be able to get a car that can drive itself? Sounds good. Well, definitely happy to, well, at least try to answer that one. But before I go there, well, don't call Detroit, Waymo, Tesla, Uber a niche. It's certainly much, much more than just a niche that that we're doing our work in. But it's definitely very focused what I'm doing. So that's correct. Now, when will you be able to basically get in a car in, uh, let's say, Manhattan um, and uh, push a button and it takes you to rural Pennsylvania to a cottage or something like that? Well, as we say, door to door, uh, that will take a long time. Uh, and a long time we would measure in decades, so plural, not definitely not just 10 years. It, it's going to take more. But um, maybe the major thoroughfares, um, the um, toll roads where you can actually implement some infrastructure that helps the vehicle to see the road and to manage just automobile traffic a little bit more, Similar to what I said earlier about aircraft traffic, and if you have that infrastructure on toll roads, maybe, uh, then it can happen actually within the next decade that uh, maybe 95% of the distance, the vehicle really drives itself. And uh, so that's more near term, actually. So um, definitely a good time to get excited about it, but not overly excited. It will still take a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so about... 230 miles of the 250 mile drive is on route 80 i80 mm-hmm. and there you go. so what's the current state of self-driving vehicles so you hear about yep. maybe some cars have some self-driving aspects yeah. but the driver still has to be in the seat kind of ready to mm-hmm. take over but mm-hmm. like where what what's the current state of self-driving right 
So at this point, it might be helpful to um, point to the levels of automation as defined by SAE International. SAE International is the industry association of engineers in the automotive and aerospace industries. And full disclosure, I also work with SAE International. Um, so I might be a little bit biased, but their um, levels of automation definition is broadly used in the industry. Not everybody likes it, but it's broadly used. And it basically goes from a very basic vehicle that would be level zero to level one, which is that your vehicle maybe just keeps the distance uh, from the car in front of you, or maybe keeps your vehicle in the lane that you don't really run um, off lane into the ditch or something like this. Level two would be those two combined, but the human, the driver, you, still needs to monitor it at all times. And this is how far we've gotten. There's, uh, and I'm sure the listeners here uh, are following to some extent the discussion. There's a lot of discussion about Tesla autopilot, which technically is a level two system, which means it keeps the distance to the car in front of you, keeps you very, very nicely in the lane, even makes lane changes, can actually stop at stop signs and all of these things, but the driver still has to monitor at all times, which it actually says on the Tesla website, if someone wants to look it up. And this is how far we've gotten. And then level three is a very particular animal. Happy to talk about it maybe um, later. But four and five would be that there's no human required. So even if something goes wrong, that the vehicle can deal with it, at the very least, just come to a stop. And four would be just on I-80, and five would be more or less door-to-door. -door. And even if you change your mind and say, oh, Pennsylvania, that's fine. But let me just go and visit uh, Sven. Let's just drive a little bit further to California, and you just change your mind. So everywhere would be level five. Now, uh, what we just said, level four-ish can be maybe within the next decade, level five, way out there. Right now, we are at level two, which means the vehicle technically drives itself but it has to be with human oversight okay interesting talk to me a bit about um the kind of connected piece like what, mm -hmm. what what's going on there what's the state of the state on that yeah so what's going on there it's actually quite quite interesting but i will say a um, little bit depressing to look at the history because much of this started almost 25 years ago when the Department of Transportation in the United States, I think it was 1996 actually, so exactly five, uh, 25 years. They basically said, the Department of Transportation, hey, we need to bring down traffic accidents and we need to improve efficiency of traffic. So let's connect vehicles and make sure that they share their location and their um, speed and heading and all of this and we can avoid collisions and uh, they started by reserving a certain communication spectrum and uh, to figure out okay how do you communicate speed and location from a gm vehicle to a chrysler vehicle to a toyota to a honda bmw mercedes what have you and that standardization is incredibly tough and more or less by the time they figured that out technology has had progressed so much that you can do much of this without a DOT system, but with, um, let's say, 4G or certainly 5G um, cell phone communication. So that we are right now seeing some manufacturers just connecting the car to the phone, and at least you can share these um, this sort of information between the same brand. But it's a little bit of... A, wild west almost like yeah but then the gm vehicle cannot really talk to a toyota but okay fine there's like 15 percent market share of gm good enough to get started so that's one piece the other piece is um software over the air updates so same as your your smartphone or your laptop will that you have and it gets an update like once a month or whatever also for automobiles that they get a software update tesla is the absolute um, pioneer in that field. They've been doing this for three, if not five years. The traditional automakers are catching up, and that's also part of connectivity because it's like a, a wireless communication link 
that basically gets the latest software update into the vehicle. And then there's basically anything in between, which probably some of our listeners have in their vehicles, um, might want to have in their vehicles that um, map updates for navigation, that Spotify or, or something like this, Pandora you want to listen to in your car, that um, obviously Google Maps and um, points of interest search, all with an internet connection. So basically the car becoming part of the internet, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's great. I've seen a, a few articles about cars being hacked. So that's, yes. that's a concern as well, right? Someone might it take is. control of your vehicle or... It's especially if your car is self-driving and you and, and that's exactly where trust comes in. And um, I think, well, you and I, we discussed this some time back why mobility is such an important term to me as opposed to just automotive or just transportation. So mobility is really something like there's a lot of te technical aspects to it, but, but also um, societal, psychological and emotional aspects. And trust comes in, and the moment you know, or at least you start thinking about it, oh, my car is connected to the internet. What about adversarial behavior of malicious actors? Uh, if I want to see a left and the car goes right, is that possible? Well, technically it is possible, and um, the automotive industry takes this very, very seriously. But um, we all know can you really be one step ahead of these malicious actors that don't do anything else than figuring out malicious things? That's tough. But I also want to caution, um, planes are connected, traffic lights are connected, uh, nuclear power plants are connected. We are living in a totally connected world. Sure, automobiles are next and they might be closer to, to our own vest and heart and health. Uh, but, um, it's a big topic. Um, for now, we seem to have a pretty good understanding what needs to be done. There are hiccups here and there, but it's a it's a real topic, sure. On terms of electric vehicles, tell me mm -hmm. a bit about like what's going on, particularly in terms of the whole charging infrastructure yeah. and what what some of the things that have to get in place and our charging mm -hmm. our charging stations going to be you know. Like brand specific, or is there an industry yeah. standard, and who's paying to roll it out, and are gas stations going to go extinct? Like, walk to me, tell me a little bit about what's going on with charging. Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's another important point um, to really see why mobility matters so much beyond just automotive, because to build this ecosystem, quite frankly, that you can actually have a um, um, satisfying, hopefully a delightful experience driving an electric car even more than what you know or used to know from a gasoline or diesel for that matter powered vehicle that means uh, charging is really important and um, it, it it is just such that batteries at least let's say for the first 10 years of mass market electric vehicles batteries were relatively small except Tesla. Tesla had from the beginning pretty big batteries that you get 300 miles out of it. But a Nissan Leaf, for instance, had only a 100 mile range and then it needed to recharge again. And that's a technical specification. Again, this is where psychology comes in. Um, quite a few people actually get nervous when the gasoline tank goes below half full, right? which is when you would still have 150 miles left, but people might freak out. So translate this to an electric vehicle that only gets you 100 miles. So charging is really important for one, um, that it's available, which means you know that a gas station is more or less in every little town or every little neighborhood, basically. But a charging station, for one, there are actually not that many. There are, I think there are 130,000 gas stations in the country. And let's say every gas station has average six to eight pumps. So it gives you quite some opportunity for fueling up. But these charging stations, there were definitely not that many in the beginning. You also didn't see them that much because you see a Shell or a Chevron or a Gulf or what have you, gas station, like, oh, there's a gas station, I'm covered. These charging stations are much smaller and um, not so easy to see. So people freak out, like, where should I charge? Where should I charge? Granted, apps help if you have your app that tells you where all the charging stations are. 
But then exactly as you say, well, um, what about compatibility? Is my vehicle compatible with that charging standard? Which is again, where pretty good standardization work um, has been done that basically all vehicles use the same plug except Tesla, because Tesla, um, let me talk about them in a minute, it's a great story in itself. But everybody else agreed on, okay, that's the plug, at least technically they should connect. But uh, when you then actually get into one of these electric vehicles and you drive up to a charging station, ooh, you're not registered for this network. Oh, your credit card cannot be read or something like this. It's very similar to um, cell phone technology. You might be with AT&T and you cannot use Sprint, something like that. We actually talk about roaming for electric vehicle charging, that you can actually use other networks. So, which is quite interesting that quite some of this thinking from um, cell phone communication um, now is as a business model put into electric vehicle charging. And that might include Tesla. So, Tesla really t took a great position I want to say about eight years ago, 2013 sounds about right. So just round around, uh, right around the time when Tesla Model S launched, the Tesla also said, okay, we're going to bring out fast charging, which they call supercharger. And they put it very strategically and very well done, actually, um, to the major routes where people would travel. San Francisco, Los Angeles is certainly one. I'm sure New York. DC is, is probably one up to Boston, the corridors and whatnot. And, um, but proprietary only for Tesla vehicles, but then in the beginning, free of charge, literally and figuratively didn't need to pay for it. But, but that actually helped a lot because people then again, trust that this vehicle can swing it for them because Elon, Elon Musk took care of us and put a supercharger every whatever, 80 miles. So, so that works out now pretty well. It's still a question, how long does it take to charge? Because if you are used to filling up your gasoline tank, it takes five minutes max. Um, getting an extra 100 miles out of even fast charging, probably at least 15 minutes. And that's where, to your last point, Will, uh, what about gas stations in the future? I mean, gas stations make quite some, well, revenue, certainly profit by the sales of candy bar, cigarettes, in some states, liquor, um, uh, maybe charcoal for your barbecue and all of these like mini mart sort of things. So that's what we need to figure out if that applies to electric vehicle charging stations as well. Right now we see more connection with a coffee shop or something like this because you stay there 15, 30 minutes. But again, uh, it's an ecosystem, and it's pretty exciting to see all of this coming together. Hmm. So what's your thoughts around what has to happen with the charging you know, infrastructure? And like, what sort of players are doing this? Are utilities mm -hmm. getting involved in this, like electric utilities? Or mm -hmm. is it like the gas station owners are saying, wow, we need to get with the times and put some charging stations in? Or... It's just, you know. Yeah. So I, I don't see too much from the gas station owners. The, the oil companies are definitely looking at this field uh, quite carefully. I'm not sure to what extent in the U.S., but um, BP, British Petroleum, and Shell in the U.K., both of them actually, uh, invested quite heavily into electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, which can be debated why they are doing this, because gasoline and, and, and diesel will be around for some time. But um, these companies are pretty well versed, obviously, in bringing out big infrastructure and dealing with energy. So to some extent, but um, I mean, mention Tesla, they, they basically bootstrap their own system. Then there are companies here started as startup companies like uh, uh, charge point uh, needs to be mentioned ev go needs to be mentioned um they basically said okay we have an innovative business model we are not operating the charge points and charge point is even the company name but we install those chargers and we enable the owners who buy then these chargers we enable them by um 
facilitating the whole financial uh, transaction by making sure with the local utility that they get enough electricity and all of that. So there's a whole, again, ecosystem of companies evolving around this. And then, yeah, okay, I said there's Tesla. And then there's also um, Electrify America. Electrify America is an interesting thing, which came out of the settlement that Volkswagen had out of the diesel scandal that maybe some of our listeners remember. It was uh, what, five years ago, I think. Big problem, fraud, fraudulent activity, actually, from that um, corporation around diesel emissions and things like this. And they had a settlement, I think, for $5 billion uh, with the Department of Justice. Um, uh, and basically it was said, okay, you need to invest $5 billion into sustainable slash electrical um, transportation. And they said, okay, we're going to build this charge network, which is Electrify America. I think it's then becoming the second largest or something like that. Um, so another player. And then it's to some extent, look, I mean, shopping malls, and we could discuss for the rest of the show, if shopping malls have a future, but um, definitely places of commerce of, of any kind, definitely um, workplaces. And we can discuss what the workplace of the future is going to look like. But where people go, it does become something. If you have charging opportunity there, people actually come. So that it becomes an incentive. Yeah, come to my restaurant and you get uh, 30 minutes of free charging. Okay, I go there. Whereas with the other, I don't even know if I can get back because my battery is already low. So it becomes a pretty interesting proposition. And it's also something that you don't need to have big you know, gas tanks underground. So you don't necessarily need a whole gas station. It could be even like parking spots. Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the street, I think I've seen That's, in some cities, parking spots yeah. with charging, right? That, that's that's exactly right, Will. So the statistics that, that, that I have, they're a couple of years old now, but I think they mostly hold true, definitely directionally, that 80%, 80% of the charging happens at home, which is very slow charging. It's called level two charging, whatever. We could go into detail. But it's not this fast charging, which is the same what you do with your smartphone. You plug it in when you go to bed, and in the morning it's fully charged. And that's what 80% of the charging for electric vehicles is as well. But their psychology pick, pick, uh, kicks in again. Um, we like to fancy all these ideas like what Will Beckman just said, I want to go to rural Pennsylvania. Great. I mean, how often do you really do this? I, mean, you, I think you do it once a quarter or something like this, Will. But this is what you pick a car for. And therefore you think, oh, will I have enough charge? Even if most of the ch charging happens at home, you want to know that on your road to rural Pennsylvania, there's charging opportunity. And um, that's what we need to figure out, therefore. And um, where you need to talk then to local utilities, where we might need to talk to maybe gas stations. That they say they are at the major interstates. Come here and there's, there's an, an additional electrical charging. Um, it is, it is happening, but it's a little bit chicken-egg problem. So if there are not enough electric vehicles, you cannot make much money actually with charging. Uh, so why would you invest in that and the other way around? Talk to me about uh, the shared aspect of, of mobility, mm -hmm. and that I imagine may extend beyond just automobiles to also scooters and mm -hmm. you know even like, bikes or other types of mobility. What, yeah. what are some of the things that are going on there? Yeah, let's see. So um, I, I actually did some research because I'm, I'm working on my book and happy to do another podcast at some point when the book is finally out, knock on wood. But the research that I did actually car sharing, car sharing goes back to the 1950s. So more than 60 years now, uh, 70 years almost. And that, that was in Switzerland. And it was some sort of a neighborhood community thing where they said, oh, this is like modern living and not every household needs a car we can share and all of this. So the idea is not new. But all of this basically got a huge boost through smartphones and apps that you didn't need to call anyone like, hey, I need a vehicle on Wednesday afternoon. Oh, tough luck already all booked. Oh, too bad. But if you see this on your on your smartphone app, and I think many of us probably have played around with it, whether that's um, car sharing, certainly all of us have used Uber and Lyft. 
but also scooters and bicycles. If you see it on your smartphone app, it's a pretty pleasant experience. And the spectrum, as you said, goes from uh, cars to bicycles to scooters to even like motor scooters, like, like Vespa kind of things that are shareable. But guess what? Even to trucks, uh, even in trucking, where, where I do some work in commercial vehicles, where it's like, well, trucks are not used all the time. Can they not be utilized better and shared? So in, in the end, it becomes something to match the demand and maximize utilization. And the spectrum we usually look at, if we are not talking about commercial vehicle and trucks at the moment, it's really car sharing, uh, it's, it's ride hailing, ride sharing, which is a little bit of a difference, and then what's called micro mobility, which is e-scooters and bikes. And there might be micro transit that you can throw in, but it's not really going that strong. So it's quite a spectrum. Seems in the micro mobility, different cities have taken different directions. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I know when I've been out on the some of the West Coast cities, there's uh, uh, you know all these. I don't know. I forget if it's if it's the Lime bikes or the mm -hmm. the the red ones. Um, the Scoot and um, Pump, yeah, it, I think. It gets, it gets confusing. Jump. All yeah, the Jump. Stuff. Yeah. But and uh, whereas in New York City, you don't see all those around. But city bikes are amazing. Yeah. I just I'm so. Yeah. I'm so in love with city bikes, especially since they came to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so those have really been a game changer for me, just being able to get a city bike out. It's very different than even just better than, better than owning your own bike. Because mm -hmm. you, be. yeah. Yeah, you can, you know, go, you can go into the city and then get a bike and ride home or ride yep. someplace. You don't have to, you don't have to park it, have it stolen, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what, what do you, what are some of the things happening around, just that micro mobility that yeah. you see, like different experiments happening. What what, what yeah. do you see being successful? What things have tried that didn't work out so well? Yeah. Well, for one, the big question in in this, but but also in automobile based shared mobility, so so car sharing and and ride hailing and that, the big thing is profitability. To my knowledge, there's not a single service that's profitable overall. And I've made this statement often in front of people who run um, car sharing operations at, at large companies or scooter sharing or something like this. And they say, yeah, we are profitable in some markets, uh, but, but not as a whole. So they are still all subsidized. And that's probably reflective of what you said, Will, that it's different in different cities because for one, regulation is different. I think the city of San Francisco allowed two or three different companies for scooter sharing because they saw that the scooters were just cluttering the sidewalks because, yeah, it's nice that Will says it's very convenient and you don't need to look for parking. You just drop it off. And that's then what it looks like. It just got dropped off in the middle of the sidewalk and I trip over it in the middle of the night. How great is that? So th that is pretty interesting to see. And again, this is where I just find it goes so much beyond the actual vehicle, even if the actual vehicle is just a scooter. Like, how do we handle all of this? So, so there's that. And another important factor and distinction in, in scooter and even more in bike sharing is whether it's station based, which basically means you bring back the bicycle to this, to a station and into a dock and then it locks at this dock. Or if you can drop it off within the perimeter of a, of a city, and as long as you are in whatever, like a 10 mile perimeter of a, of a city, you're good to drop it off wherever you want, uh, which is easier, obviously, for the user to just drop it off, but it might be tougher for the user to know where the scooter or um, bicycle is. And uh, maybe some of um, our listeners um, have also seen those pictures of huge numbers of shared bicycles just being crushed. So it, it has become some sort of a throwaway article uh, or throwaway product where we say, yeah, we've used these bikes half a year, but now the tires are flat and a few spokes are broken and the brakes don't work that well anymore throw it away, get a new one. Or it didn't quite work out in this city, so rather than transporting 
500 bicycles to another city, let's just throw them away and get some new ones. So for one, again, profitability needs to be figured out, but also how long last these um, scooters and um, bicycles. And also, is it actually a sustainable mobility overall? Because if it's a throwaway mentality, that doesn't work too well. And just one more point, Will. Uh, scooter versus bicycle, that's debated a lot. Obviously, you can go typically further with a bicycle. But um, so my, my last name is Biker, and I take it pretty literal. I, I, I like cycling. So I'm, I'm not a scooter person. I, I like cycling. And um, but a bicycle has more um, risk of failure, can have flat tires, a scooter does not. Granted, there are bicycles that don't have pneumatic tires, they just have rubber stuff, something that cannot go flat. Okay, fine. But a bicycle has spokes, has these brake levers and cables that can fail. And uh, so a scooter is just more ruggedized, if you will. And also a scooter is easier to get on and off versus a bicycle if people are not that used to cycling anymore because their high school days are like 20, 30 years in the past. Oh my God, on a bicycle, I don't know, can I still do it? A scooter might be easier, which is why I say, even if I personally prefer cycling, scooters might make it. We'll see. Yeah. Talk to me about the kind of ecosystem of companies that are playing at least in one of these areas what are what are some of the major companies that we should know and you can talk mm. if these are you know these are if there's some startups that we should know about or yeah. the larger yeah. players go yeah. across these categories yeah no absolutely Let, let's go across these categories and start with a and aces like autonomous driving I mean, there's, there's Waymo, which is um, autonomous driving or self-driving group out of Google slash Alphabet. And uh, they've been around till since 2009. So 12 years, Google has been working on self-driving cars. They, many, many agree that they might be really the front runner and they have operations in Phoenix, Arizona, Austin, San Francisco, Mountain View and whatnot. So there's, there's Google Waymo. Then Cruise, Cruise got acquired by General Motors in 2016 or something like that. Um, Unicorn and all of that big, I think they have 1500 people working on this. Then that's GM Cruise, there's Ford Argo, Argo AI, which actually now is Ford and Volkswagen collaborating and uh, supporting Argo, which is about the same size of uh, Cruise. Also considered a front runner. Then there's Aurora. Aurora is uh, very smart people that have backgrounds from Waymo, Tesla, and Uber. Founded that company, I think, four years ago. Unicorn, they're going to go, I think, spec merger. I don't think traditional IPO. Still before the end of the year. Um, and then there's quite a few of these um, autonomous trucks. Uh, there's Too Simple. There's Kodiak, uh, Plus AI. Um, most of them basically have at least a Silicon Valley presence. Many actually were founded in Silicon Valley. And then there's these self-driving um, delivery vehicles or delivery robots. Nuro, N-U-R-O, Nuro needs to be mentioned. Udelf uh, certainly needs to be mentioned. So these sort of companies. So that's for autonomous. Um, then for connected, it, it's an interesting mix. I mean, there are some really specialized companies that do a lot in cybersecurity, as you said. They they do a lot in software over the air updates. Um, lesser known companies, there's this Red Band, which got acquired by Harman, which got acquired by Samsung. Uh, but um, also um, the cell phone company like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, uh, T-Mobile, they are pretty active in this space. Uh, and then companies that do a lot in um, tele, um, telemonitoring of vehicles, telematics and things like this. Uh, there was um, Omni, what was that? Omni something, which got acquired by Verizon. Verizon is very, very active in that space. 
Well, electric vehicles, everybody knows Tesla. Um, we did see last year, and we're still carrying over a little bit into this year, um, quite a few companies going SPAC merger and going public in that way. There's um, Lucid Motors, Lucid Motors here in um, Silicon Valley. Could be, maybe the closest to what the next Tesla could be. Uh, uh, Lucid, then there's Fisker down in LA, there's Lordstown Motors, um, then there's uh, Rivian. Rivian got huge investment, well, huge, half a billion, which is big, but not huge in our space, actually. <laughs> half a billion investment from Amazon, same amount from Ford. So there's Rivian, they are starting production now, actually, like electric uh, vehicle pickup truck and Amazon delivery vehicle. And there are a few electric truck companies. Nikola, somewhat infamous because their IPO got a lot of scrutiny, I, th I think for a number of good reasons, because they promised things to investors that were a little bit hard to justify, but that's hydrogen powered uh, long haul trucks. So very interesting thing as well. So that's about electric and shared, I mean, basically household names, obviously Uber and Lyft, and, and then all these scooter and bicycle companies. But also the traditional automotive manufacturers are definitely getting a lot into shared mobility. So GM had their Maven program, which they discontinued because couldn't make it profitable. Ford had tried a lot of things, including uh, Chariot, Micro Transit, uh, Ford had um, bicycle sharing in San Francisco, which they sold to Lyft, I believe. BMW, Mercedes had their shared vehicle programs, which they then merged because they couldn't really get it beyond critical mass. So, Will, there are a lot of companies. How much more time do you have? <laughs> That's a big <laughs> list. Yeah, yes. It, it seems like the... And uh, I'm not reading that list. It's just what comes to my mind. If I prepare the list, man, it gets even longer. It'd be a long, <laughs> long discussion. Yeah. It seems that with the the shared cars where it seems that those may be, at least my own personal experience in New York City is that they, I saw there was like a year or two ago, there was all these cars in my neighborhood. I think they were like to go maybe. And, uh, car to go probably. Yeah, yeah. car to go. And, you, yeah. and there was you know an app. You could open them up and get in. Yeah. It yeah. seems they've all disappeared. Like it's just that, you know. It, yeah it's people either want to just own their own car or if they want to get somewhere, they just get an Uber yeah. you know, or a Lyft to where they're going. And yeah. there's not as much demand yeah. for, no, I want to drive it myself and I want to rent the car for two hours. There's less need for that. Mm. Cause in, in, at least in New York, you have to go park it. So exactly. Um, unless you're going, yeah, no, yeah. it's, it, it's a, it's a tough business. Will and the, the car to go that, um, that's Mercedes Daimler Daimler. And they, they did this. It actually merged, at least in Europe, uh, it, it merged with BMW's Drive Now service. But it basically tells us getting to profitability is just so tough. And the problem is um, to really handle supply and demand. And um, it, it's, again, a, a, a catch-22 or chicken-egg problem. If there's not too much demand, why would you deploy all these vehicles that are just sitting in the streets? And if there are not enough vehicles sitting in the streets, why would I sign up for the servers? And even more, why would I get rid of my own vehicle if there are not enough of these shared vehicles? And um, it, it certainly is a lot of um, um, investment. Um, like um, you need to buy all these vehicles or you need to make these vehicles and finance them at least and put them in the streets, uh, whereas Uber and Lyft obviously has a very different business model with a two-sided marketplace, where basically Uber and Lyft put the um, expenses um, onto the drivers and say, well, we help you maybe with financing a vehicle, but we are not going to buy the vehicle. So uh, the capital investment um, is very different for car sharing than it is for ride hailing. So Zipcar versus Uber, for instance. And, that's why Zipcar um, had a problem scaling up and car to go even more. But Uber and Lyft could scale up just like hell. Yeah. And you knew like within three minutes, a vehicle shows up. And uh, that's why car sharing 
I, I don't know if, if that has a great future, honestly. It, it might go back to what it originally was in the 1950s in Switzerland. There's your um, condo complex where you live, and maybe they have, I don't know, 50 vehicles for um, 200 families or something like this, which, which might work. Because um, it's one thing about 30% utilization. That's what people tell me from car sharing. You want to go to 30% utilization to basically be profitable. If you get much beyond that, that basically means that nothing can go wrong. So not an empty tank, not a broken car, nobody can be late uh, because that all causes friction. So you've got to aim for 30%. But to have a business run with relatively high capital investment to run it on 30% utilization, good luck, Will. I'm not sure if I recommend this to you. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that there, I mean, there must be businesses out there doing the following, but at least as a consumer, I haven't really become aware of them. Of, I haven't really seen a successful Airbnb for cars where if I'm not driving today, mm -hmm. that you, you can just go and like use an app to open my car and drive it around and pay me like you could my yeah. my house. You know, I haven't I haven't seen it. Uh, Interesting. Well, let me tell you something that is two row and get around get around in two row, uh, two competitors. Uh, and there were a few others, but I think two row and get around are the only ones that uh, are still around at this point, which is exactly this. It's peer to peer car sharing. So the, the typical number that we use is that a privately owned automobile, a privately owned automobile is parked, not used 94% of the time. 94% of the time you're not using it, it's a dead, unused asset. So you can certainly rent it out. It, it becomes an emotional value again. Really, do I want someone else to drive my car? I, I don't know. But um, some people are totally fine with it. And um, But the, the fact that you don't know it, uh, I think it's, it's just um, uh, telling that these services have a, just a hard time to get the visibility that they might deserve because these vehicles are there. Um, if you just look in any neighborhood street, all these cars are parked. We can use them better than this, but it's tough. Yeah. How do you stay current on what's going on in this industry where there's so much dynamism? Do you follow mm -hmm. blogs or newsletters, or is it just a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations or going to conferences or mm. industry journals or s some of the above? Like, how do you stay up to date? Yeah, it's, ac it's actually all of the above, Will. Uh, so I actually do read newsletters, and I, I have my Google News alerts um, that actually comes in every Thursday afternoon, so we'll come in today again. And I have them set up on, guess what? Autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. So what's going on there? So I, I read those things. I discuss a lot with people in my network. And um, on the one hand, if everybody asks the same question, then that's probably a topic that I might look at. And, and maybe I publish something and engage in a community conversation again. Um, certainly one learns from the clients and that, that's really important to me as an independent consultant who positions himself in this niche, as you said, as an expert. So I, I have to get insights from the real world and I will not say this company is doing this, but to see what is possible and uh, sometimes graciously a client might get me behind the curtain and want to get my opinion on something. And uh, they will get my opinion. I will not tell anybody anything secret, obviously. But so I do rely on these engagements and um, to, to see what's going on. And hey, also my, my class at Stanford that I lecture. So I lecture at the business school at Stanford. I'm in charge of inviting the, the guest lectures. So I can be somewhat uh, selfish and inviting someone where I also can learn something. And I learn a lot from student questions and in fact well also from your questions and uh, that i'm like huh that question i hadn't really thought about so let me read something up which is anything from wikipedia to, to real technical papers and specifications like i should know this i i do spend some time i want to say well it might be something between 
10, 15 percent of my time to actually educate, educate myself, because otherwise you cannot sustain yourself as an expert in the field. Any blogs, podcasts, newsletters, websites that you'd, that you'd want to mention as useful sources that you follow? Um, yeah, there actually are like, like three or so that, that I typically mention to, to clients to get smart. Let's see if I can remember them. There's from TechCrunch. TechCrunch has a pretty good newsletter. I think it's called This Station. This Station from TechCrunch. That is, that is definitely a good one. It's from Kristen Kurosek, um, TechCrunch, The Station. Then there's, um, okay, full disclosure, a buddy of mine. It's Riley Brennan. Riley Brennan runs his VC fund, which is Trucks VC. Doesn't have to do anything with trucks and trucking. I don't know how he came up with that name. He could never really explain it to me. But it's uh, Future of Transportation, F O T. Um, newsletter from Riley Brennan at Trucks VC. And guess what? It's maybe more the traditional industry, but the Center for Automotive Research in Michigan. Center for Automotive Research um, run by Carla Bailo, um, in out of Ann Arbor. They have a pretty good newsletter. And then maybe Bloomberg. Bloomberg uh, New Energy Finance. I think that thing is called Hyperdrive or something like that. Um, that is one that I'm getting every day, and I actually read it, and I learn something from it. So it's quite a bit. Fantastic. And of course, there's there's Sven Bikers LinkedIn and his blog on his website. But mine mine is maybe more a um, um, little bit here and there. The other ones are really regular newsletters, great source of information. Sorry, you were saying? No, on that topic. For listeners that want to follow up and find out more about your work and re reach out, mm -hmm. where would you point them online? It's it's really LinkedIn. So the freshest, the newest I have is on LinkedIn. I put it then on my blog on my website, which is siliconvalleymobility.com, siliconvalleymobility.com. I put it there on my blog as well, but it's it's really mostly on LinkedIn, which works very well for me. So I get great followership and um, also conversations going through LinkedIn. People leave a comment. I really make an effort answering those comments. Um, so it's LinkedIn mostly. Fantastic. Well, Sven, fascinating to hear about what's going on in your space. Uh, thanks so much for joining today. It was good. Thanks for having me, Will. Absolutely.